Welcome to By the Numbers. Now this is a, a new program that uh, will focus on a major issue that really resonates with uh, a, a ver variety of people and groups, whether it's officials, residents, uh, taxpayers, uh, and it's also something that's frequently debated on social media. That is a budget. And it's not necessarily just a municipal budget. It could be a school department budget. It could be a department budget, police, fire, you name it. Uh, it could be discussed. And that's the plan is to sit here and discuss budgets right up to the state budget, which is right around the corner. Uh, the mission of the show is to sit down with local stakeholders and get their thoughts and concerns on the town's financial picture and gain a perspective on the process. Now, our guest today uh, is a Whitman resident who is one of a few who can actually call himself a townie, a third generation. Uh, and he also owns multiple businesses. He has served as a selectman, is very active in the community and organizing town-wide events. Uh, we welcome, of course, Mr. Richard Rosen. Thank you, Kevin. Congratulations on your new show. You like, thank you. And, and your new set. You like the set. The huh? set's beautiful. Thanks. See, uh, somebody who deals in real estate, somebody who's Rest. a business owner, you like Waiting it. to eat. I mean, this is great. Yeah, I'm mean, actually, I get a couple of pies coming from McGuigan's. It's we perfect. <laughs> um, I think that the main reason to have you here is somebody who really is involved when it comes to, first and foremost, being someone who's, who is a, is a realtor. You're dealing with different departments, whether it's, uh, or, or, or boards, whether it's planning, whether it's conservation. Um, you also somebody who served two terms on the Board of Selectmen. You kind of have an idea as to what's going on. And uh, again, you're a community-oriented person who's done a lot for the community. Uh, as I said, it, Board of Selectmen back in the 1980s, what made you want to serve the town in that capacity? Well, first of all, let's just be clear that I am not a town official and I have nothing to do with budgets. Right. Um, and I may not be able to answer some of your questions regarding the budgets because I'm not really that up to speed with some of the things going on. Right. Um, I was obviously a lot younger back then, mm. and um, <clears throat> I was interested in what was going on in the community, obviously, be, having lived here all my life. And one day there was a, um, an announcement that one of the incumbent selectmen's, one of the selectmen wasn't going to run for office, for re-election. Uh, Emmett Hayes, who was then a state rep, as well as a selectman, was going to run for his seat and there was an opening for the other seat. So I said, you know, I'm going to run. Well, little did I know that five other people decided they were going to run as well. So six of us ran for that seat. Um, there was a few school committee members. Um, there were some other people that ran, and I was the political newcomer, and, uh, and I won. And back in those days, we had the elections in April, uh, and I think that my first election, we had a snowstorm. <laughs> um, and I think the second time, we did as well. So that they changed it somewhere along the line. The elections are now in May, yeah. but back in those days it was in April. And, I, um, and it wasn't easy times back in those days because it was a few years after Proposition 2.5. Right. And for those that don't know what Proposition 2.5 was or is, um, and frankly I think it was one of the best things that ever happened, uh, there was a move on by a group of people to limit the amount of money that uh, the percentages that could be taxed to people on the property tax to two and a half percent. They refer to it now as the, uh, the levy limit. And it's a good thing that they did because the way that property taxes were increasing back then, um, you would have lost, you wouldn't be able to pay the taxes on your homes. Um, they provided mechanisms to get around Proposition two and a half, but back then, um, there was a big task to balance the budgets. We, of course, our budget back then was, I think, somewhere between eight and nine million dollars. It was in the late 70s, early 80s. I think the budget in the town was eight eight to nine million, the school department budget, which wasn't uh, total regionalization back then, was three million, which then doubled in the next six years, went to six million. Um, and I think that we actually had to cut a million dollars of real money out of the budget. So it was, it was tough for a few years, and um, with some good management and good leadership, it got done. And then in subsequent years, for the next several years, we 
got an awful lot of things done in this town um, under the guise of Proposition Two and a Half. I mean, we did, in 1984, we got a, a, a town-wide sewer project approved um, with a debt exclusion, not an override. There's a, there's a huge difference. And we did it with a debt exclusion, and it passed. And at the time, we also received, and we were one of the last communities, maybe in the country, that received up to 90% federal funding. Mm. So any of the, the, the pipes that went to Brockton, the pump stations, anything that made up the main of the system was 90% funded by the federal government. And then um, the rest of the stuff was like 50%. So we came in so far under budget that we put out way more contracts than we were going to originally just to get the sewer project done. And the sewer project was paid off in 20 years because of the debt exclusion versus an override. So we paid it off. Um, we built under the leadership of Elaine Malisi a new library because the Dyer School had burnt down that was there. So we gave the land to the, the library. The senior center burnt down. It was arson. That burnt down. Both buildings. We had a arsonist running around back in those days. The J.R. Hall burnt down. We gave that land to the senior center. And, but we had sold the old Holt School across the street here, and we got a lot more money than we anticipated, so we gave seed money to all of them, and we renovated the police station. The fire. So a lot of stuff happened back then. Um, we lost federal revenue sharing, which was um, a lot of money. But, so we had financial issues, but we managed to resolve them every year. It's interesting that you had a little bit of a disclaimer before you answered my first question. I think what's important here is, is both before we move forward, at least understanding where we came from or how we got to where we are at this particular point and knowing that you were on, on the board just a few short years after Prop 2.5 became law, I think is kind of essential, knowing that how you know, the, fo the elected folks back then had to deal with you know, this new, you know, scrutinizing your money and knowing that this is, the, you're gonna live within your means of whatever the tax levy is, you know, the two and a half percent, and and being able, but still being able to, as you said, a comp, do multiple projects, uh, even including a sewer project. And, you know, and frankly, since 1990, there hasn't been a lot of projects that have been done in this town. Um, you have to balance the books, we balance the books. We did it with free cash. We did it with grants. We mm. did it with a number of things. Um, but we're talking a long time ago. And, you know, I hear a financial crisis and the world is going to come to an end. I think I remember every year for the last 30 years talk of a financial crisis every year when it comes to budget season. And it's just something that it happens every year. You know, it's funny. Frank Lynham. Frank Lanham and I don't always agree on things. Town administrator for what? Town administrator. Yeah. It used to be, I think when I was on the board, it was, I served under the very first, I think it was a business manager back then. I, they might have changed the name at some point. Everybody blames Frank for all the problems. And it's not Frank's fault. Frank is the messenger. So it's the old, don't shoot the messenger. Back in the 80s, our business manager or town manager, wherever he was, it was the same thing. He was vilified. Mm. You know, back then we didn't have social media. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault that he had to fund different budgets. It was, it was his job to find the solutions and people didn't like the solutions. We had other administrators after that. We had a female that people despised. She did a great job. Um, and I just find it amusing sometimes. I, you know, I, uh, Frank has a bullseye on his back. You know, I have a bullseye on my back. I get it, I understand. Um, he does a good job. And frankly, he's probably forgotten more about some of these budgets, and I think he served on the Board of Selectmen. He did. Um, he's probably forgotten more about some of these things than some people know. So, I mean, I just think sometimes the criticism of him is unfair. Um, you may not like the way he says it or the way he presents it, but he does a pretty good job. When you look at town meeting back then, and, and uh, d depending on the town meetings that you've attended over the past 10 or 15 years, probably the, the the thing that, that is echoed prior to the meeting, prior to, to going through the, the warrant in each article, uh, is, is that there's a lack of revenue that's been generated by the town. Uh, and the state is not giving the fair share when it comes to local aid. Um, uh, in your opinion, 
it, is this something that you, you used to hear that you heard back then and that is still being I mentioned heard it, these days? I heard it back then, I heard it now, and it's true. Revenues aren't, th there's only so much you can get in revenues. Mm. State aid, I believe, is nowhere near where it should be. You're mandated to do certain things and there's just no money to do some of the things that they want. I know I hear people talk about school busing. Um, one of the largest town meetings that we ever had that I remember was over school busing, school busing issue. Um, and it was because the people that sent their kids back then to private schools wanted the taxpayers to pay their busing. And people were outraged and it ultimately it failed. Mm. Um, we had another huge town meeting about trash. I mean, back then we also had a trash crisis. We had an insurance crisis. We have, there's many crises, but the town can deal with it. But the fact of the matter is, the revenues are not enough to keep up with the expenditures. I mean, it's, I don't know how else you could say it. I mean, you can't spend more than you make. You don't spend more than you make or you go into debt. Correct. But you just can't keep going into debt. And we have in Whitman, it's, your tax rate is based on residential and then the SIP. Um, Which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay, we'll talk about that. But there's only so much money that you can bring in a year. Mm. Um, and people talk about more development. Um, which I know a little bit about. Um, it just so happens that the stuff that I've developed has never required more police, more firemen, more school teachers, um, because condominiums that I've built a number of, they don't require it. The last project that I did, I was, you know, I was going to be the, the, the death of one of the schools, and I think out of 44 units, we have one new net kid. The, those things are good for the tax base because the Paradise Gardens property was paying $16,000 a year in taxes. Now it makes $170,000 with no new teachers, no new cops, no new firemen. We plow our own snow. We get rid of those things are good for the town of Whitman. Unfortunately, there just isn't the ability for the town to go out and create all these things. Commercial development in town is very, very difficult. I built two buildings on Bedford Street. I brought in nine new businesses, increased the tax, real tax. Uh, growth dollars by a lot. But even that won't offset the wage increases and different programs. I mean, it'd be easy to slash programs. I mean, you could bring that down in a happy, but nobody wants to slash programs. We had to go out and cut. We had a problem with the, you look at the budget, street lighting. So we cut back then one third of the street lights in the town. And I'm going to tell you, it was ugly. We, every third poll, we didn't pick and choose, we just, every third poll killed the light. And we did. And people were pretty upset that we cut the street lights, but those are things that you have to do. The, the uh, legal budget, we just cut it. I mean, you go after things that really aren't gonna hurt. You don't wanna cut the recreation program. You want the pool open. You want all these things, so it has to be funded. So where do you get the money? That's, that's the trick in balancing all of this. Do you think people don't necessarily understand what the ratio is, uh, residential to, to commercial, that, that this is mostly a, a bedroom community, that you 90 percent <clears throat> of your, your tax base is residential. And you know, because, of, because of the area, if you were closer to a main through, throughway like Route 3 or Route 24, maybe the, it, would, it would be a little bit of an uptick. But do, do people understand that? No. Most people don't understand it, and I think there's some finance committee members currently that don't understand it. And we used to have a member of the Board of Selectmen for years that didn't understand it. I used to have to, I didn't have to, but I used to go to every Selectmen's meeting every year when the assessors came up to set the tax rate. Because as a business person, I think that one of the most important things at the time was maintaining what they call the factor of one. The factor of one is that everybody is taxed the same. I mentioned the SIP. The SIP refers to the commercial, industrial, personal property it's an tax. Acronym, correct. So I think back in the many years ago that the SIP might have been eleven or twelve percent, meaning that there was eighty eight or eighty nine percent residential. I don't know the exact number now, but I think we would be safe if we said that the residential tax burden is ninety percent and the SIP is ten percent. Mm -hmm. A town like Whitman could not afford to change the factor of one, meaning you shift the burden. So if you have 90% of the people paying the rate and you shifted, 
even a slight portion. So if I tax rate, and I don't know what the tax rate is, but let's say it's $16. Mm -hmm. So you want to save some money, so you reduce the residential to 14, you'd have to increase the, the, the SIP to 30, to 30. If you increase the tax rate like that on the commercial businesses, there's a lot of marginal businesses in this town. They would go out of business. There's a lot of landlords that could not pass on that tax burden to the sub shop or the travel agency or anything else in town. So it's very important. A town like Avon has a split tax rate. Avon has a huge industrial park. Industrial park. Yeah. They have right where, off Route 24. Uh, with Jordan's Furniture and all those places, uh, all over town. Uh, I think Braintree is one of the towns, but it's a larger city. A town like Whitman, a town like Hanson, these small towns could never absorb it, right. anything other than the factor of one. Being a business owner, um, how does a community's fiscal troubles have an effect on local business? Well, I mean, as a realtor, as a realtor, I mean, it's important and it's true for me to be able to say some, to someone, we have an absolutely great police department. We have a wonderful fire department. Our park is better than most. Our library is better than most. We have a brand new school. Those things are important and it brings people to the community. If you had to say, you know, our school system is, uh, but you don't have to say that because we have a great school system as far as I'm concerned. We have a tremendous life. We have a really great town. We have a great town with great assets in it. And as a business person, it's really important because you can't, I mean, our crime rate is, you know, uh, I have no idea what the percentage is, but I'm sure it's small. It's small, but the one thing that I think that the police department is mostly dealing with is the drug, drug epidemic right now. But, the, but every town is dealing with a drug epidemic. Sure. That, Absolutely. That's a, that's a national issue. Um, I'm talking, we don't have shootings. You know, you don't have to go far from here where you do. That's a tough sell. I mean, I've looked at communities of doing business, and I'm, I won't do business in those communities. It's, Whitman is a great town to do business in. Um, we just have a lot of really good things in place. Going back to the, the, the SIP, what can be done? So your suggestion is, is don't touch the SIP, so to speak. What's the, what's the alternative to tweaking or changing the SIP? No, you can't. You can't change it other than attract new businesses mm -hmm. in town, and that's extremely difficult. Um, you what, know. what can be done to attract new businesses? Is there something that can be done? I mean, is there, there isn't necessarily, like you look at Pembroke, they got a chamber of commerce. They're very active. Does Whitman have something like that? Or would that be something that would be helpful to? We used to. Okay. Um, we used to have the, the Whitman Hanson um, Business and Professional Association, which we met every month for years. Um, believe it or not, I was chairman of it for a while. Uh, that doesn't we had, surprise we me. had great speakers every month. We had congressmen, we had judges, we had great speakers. That's important. The times have changed and things have changed. I mean, there's, first of all, there's not a lot of places to build new businesses. I built these two buildings on Route 18 and brought in nine new businesses. That's not going to happen all the time. Um, I know of other businesses right now that are thinking of going out of business and converting their property to other things than business. I mean, you know, for years, I've heard every selectman that's ever run for office said, I'm going to come into Whitman and I'm, I'm going to get into office and I'm going to bring in all kinds of business. It's a great thought, and you'd really like it to happen. Is it basically lip service? It's just, but they don't realize that it's virtually impossible. You can, you know, we had the opportunity to get Home Depot here. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. It went to the east side of Brockton. Mm -hmm. We had the opportunity, if you go way back, to have the Foxborough Company here. It didn't work out it went to East Bridgewater. So there's been opportunities that we've lost. It's very difficult to attract, attract new businesses. Um, you know, there was a study that was done in 1975 by the Old Colony Planning Council that said by the year 2000, Whitman was gonna have a population of 25,000 people. So when they did the study, the population was around 12,000, 1975. Today, I think, 16? I don't even think it's that high. <laughs> I think it might be 14, 15,000. Mm -hmm. um, and people are probably going, well, it should be much higher because of all the new development. No. It, why? Because one of the biggest reasons, I believe, so when I was a kid, all my friends whose parents moved down here from Dorchester and wherever the else they moved from, all had four, five, six, seven kids. People don't think about that. There was huge families back then. And now there's one kid, 
two kids. Mm -hmm. So that reduces it. I mean, there's been a lot of properties that have been torn down and replaced. So it's, um, it's just really difficult to um, attract new businesses. And frankly, you're not going to have a big increase in residential because it just isn't the space to do it. Would, you know, during the time that you served on the Board of Selectmen, at that time, there wasn't a school district. There was uh, Whitman, Whitman cared for Whitman, but a few years later down the road was the formation of the district. Is the district something that, that helps both communities or does it hinder them in regards to financially? First of all, it was more than a few years. So back in 1960, 1960 they regionalized the high school. When I was in Board of Selectmen, we had some offers by the state that if we were willing to regionalize K through eight, there was some real money that they were dangling in mm. front of us. The Board of Selectmen applied for a grant to study it. We won the grant. The town administrator at the time applied for it, we won the grant. The school committee wouldn't accept it for whatever reason, but that's fine. It was probably more than 10 years later 15 years later that all of a sudden things changed and we needed to regionalize K through 8, which I think, and I don't know the finances of the schools or the region or what we get in reimbursements, but from a practical standpoint, I think it's a great thing. I went to Whitman schools, I went to Whitman Hanson. So if you had the kids in Whitman learning one criteria of whatever it was, math, science, and kids in Hanson learning other things that weren't on the same page. When we got to the ninth grade, we were in different places. And it was difficult to get on the same page so everybody could learn the same thing. So I think for equality, for the kids that eventually end up in the high school together, I think it's important that they're all learning the same thing. So I think it's a great thing. Um, and it brings Whitman and Hanson closer together. So I, I think regionalization, it, it should have been done when we tried to do it. Um, but it wasn't, but I think it's a great thing. Financially, I don't know what we get for it. No, again, knowing somebody, again, dealing <coughs> with the town budget, um, and I just want to get your general opinion here, and that is, you know, the conversation has been ongoing since late last year that something needs to be done financially, that the, the town has to come up with a long-term plan so there's not any further fiscal issues Right now, supposedly, there's a sizable deficit. That's what's being bandied about. Um, Which is nothing new, by the way. Right. There's and a sizable deficit every year. Every year. Um, but, but the thought is, I mean, can you, can you do an override? Can you override your way out of a fiscal crisis? No. Not in my opinion. I, you know, we did a debt exclusion. But folks don't understand what a debt exclusion is. A debt exclusion is you vote to expend a certain amount of money. But it goes away. It goes away. Right. So we did a debt exclusion for the sewer system. Mm -hmm. It was a, I believe, and you know my memory isn't what it used to be, but I believe it was a 20 year bond. We paid off that sewer system. So it's not, it's not there anymore. You do an override, it never goes away. I never thought that in this town, and probably most towns, that you could ever get an override to pass. We have, um, it doesn't go away. Do I believe that you could override yourself out of debt? No, because you're gonna end up in, in debt the following year. Because Once you take, for instance, we had to give, we didn't have to give, we gave the school committee $800,000 way back when, so they could proceed and, and provide the education that they needed to. I'm talking about the 80s. Before we started the following year, we were that much money in debt, and I believe we might be in that same situation right now. I don't think you can, you can override your way out of debt. It's possible. Um, some people might want to say, yeah, 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 we'll do it. But what they say in public, it would be easy to get it past a town meeting. You could pass an override at town meeting easily. When you go to the ballot box, it's a different story, and my feeling is most people aren't going to vote for an override. Mm -hmm. um, there's other ways that you're going to need to to resolve it. You know, I hear this talk about, oh, we need a long, long range capital plan. Well, that's great, but if you don't have any capital, what's the sense of having a capital plan? Right. I mean, and I'm not being a wise guy, you need to plan for the future, but the fact of the matter is you need to fund your police department. You need to fund your fire department. You need to fund 
your school department, and your highway department, because these departments all do things that need to be done. You know, there was a, a big hubbub some months ago about privatizing the ambulance. <clears throat> Wasn't something new because when I was the chairman of the Board of Selectmen, we had a FinCom member who wanted to privatize the ambulance. And it was an outrageous idea and thought. I spent four days with the then chief, acting chief Dick Reno, who was our current chief's dad. I was just really unhappy that this was even suggested because I thought it was, obviously we need the ambulance service, and I also thought it was a profitable service. So I went back, <clears throat> I spent four days with him going over everything to do with the ambulance, and lo and behold, not only then, but 30 years later, it's still the most profitable service, and probably the best service. And I don't want to degrade, you know, the cops that are going to arrest the bad guys, but if you're having a heart attack, you want to be able to call 911 and have the ambulance show up. Mm -hmm. So privatizing the ambulance that has been suggested is, is not a good idea. There are, we need to fund all these services. You don't want to be without your fire department. You don't want to be without the police department. You want your streets plowed and you want your trash picked up. So you want to be able to bring your kid to the pool in the middle of the summer. So there needs to be a way to resolve the funding crisis. It's, it, we have a spending issue. We have a revenue issue. It's a tough balance. Which again, not to interrupt, yep. is where Frank Lynham does a pretty damn good job in putting it together and, and presenting it. But what, a lot of the, what about a lot of the younger families that you have here who've got, who've got little ones and they're, <laughs> they're willing they're willing to see cuts to departments in order to fund the school district, especially if, and it seems as though at times it's pitting the younger folks against the older folks because you get some folks who aren't fixed incomes. What's your thoughts on that? And that's, that's not a new, new concept. My thought it's on that, forever. It's, never ch it's been that way forever. Right. It was that way when I was on the board. You do not want to pit one department against the other because that's not right. Mm. I understand that people want everything that they want. But in the real world, sometimes you can't always get what you want. I mean, it's hard. It's, I'm, you know what? I'm glad I'm not a town official. I'm glad I'm not getting the calls that we used to get about, you know, my You didn't have social lawyer. media around back then oh, either. No, that's that's quite the... But, you know, thank God. But there are ways to save money. For instance, we are now um, changing all the street lights to LED bulbs. That's going to save a ton of money. That's a great idea. Mm. Um, we need to look at non-essential things that maybe don't need to be funded. But I mean, there are things that can't be controlled. Insurance costs. OPEP. There's, there's, there's just so much that, that it's just, it's a very, very difficult line that they have to walk. And well, I don't envy them. We've plumb run out of time, but is there anything that, that we haven't covered or anything that you want to say in closing? And, and again, I want to thank you for being my guest on this program. No, I mean, I just, you know, I put a lot of faith and confidence into the people that are running this town. And um, I think the people running it now are doing a good job. And, you know, you don't always agree with what they do. Um, but I think, you know, since I've been around and I've been involved for a long time, that you have boards that, that at the end of the day, get it done. And you know what? I have full faith and confidence that they'll get it done now and we'll survive and we'll continue on with everything that we have. Excellent. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very and, much. And thank you for tuning in to uh, By the Numbers, as uh, this is a program that we hope to help educate you about the budget process, the financial uh, the financials of the two towns that we serve, Whitman and Hanson. And if you have any input, any questions you think that should be asked while we have guests here, doesn't matter who the guest is, uh, info at whca.tv. And until the next program, have a great day. I'm <laughs> sorry.